Welcome to News from Underground. Today we have uh, a lot of uh, our special guests, Matt Bellilli. Again, all right, welcome. Uh, we've done this several times before already. Not right? For a while, though. For a while now. Yeah, for a while. <laughs> for a couple of years Good now. to be back. <laughs> uh, I guess that's something I guess want to take a really break from what we're going to talk about really quickly. Um, reintroduce yourselves. Like, where, where do you come from? Or very, like, in, like two minutes. Um, areas of interest of anarchy and um, mm -hmm. I guess the things, uh, what brings you here? Well, um, I uh, got into anarchism originally from um, from economics, uh, which is usually it's the other way around if someone has an interest in that, so I think that's really cool. I'm um, working on a book right now about um, the cultural consequences of equality and how the uh, obsession with egalitarianism is destroying civilization effectively, and uh, that's in the works right now. And uh, This will probably be my last news for underground for a while because I'm going to be moving to Austria to uh, be do an internship with the Austrian Economic Center and uh, just trying to enjoy the time while I got it left. Here. Yeah, we'll be back there like summertime or something, right? Be back April 22nd. Great, that's in time for Anaconda. That's right. <laughs> uh, and, and for yourself, I think uh, we were kind of rushed when we were introducing, starting the show, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's 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 more complicated for me. I mean, I started off very liberal, and I ended up... Um, I ended up kind of getting into objectivism and things like that, and eventually I kind of... After... You know, a couple of chips at that wall. Um, I eventually realized that as a as a skeptic, I could no longer really trust the use of force, um, and it clicked. I guess hmm. so. Just logically, I, I I realized that I wasn't being consistent. Nice. <laughs> yeah. kind of it happened sort of by accident while I was talking to a uh, a Democratic nominee. Um, Supporter that uh, that told me that she worked at Taco Bell, and I just kind of said, "Yeah, I'm an anarchist." Yeah. <laughs> I'm an anarchist. I finally said it. I might yeah. say. <laughs> the identity has been spoken. That's yeah. great. <laughs> um, and yeah, so with that, we're going to start the first uh, article. U.S. churches are now costing taxpayers seventy-one billion dollars a year. Are they now? A new study says that taxes and churches in the United States are costing its citizens $71 billion each year in tax breaks. According to the Secular Policy Institute, religious groups received $35.3 billion in federal income tax subsidies and $26.2 billion in property tax credits. They also enjoy $6.1 billion in state income tax, $1.2 billion of parsonage, and $2.2 billion in faith-based initiative subsidies. Uh, I bring this up because a lot of people like to do the jealous tax slave uh, position where it's like, well, you're not robbing from them enough. You're robbing from us, but you're not robbing them. You know, it's like you should also, it's like this whole weird um, trying to drive each other in their own deeper hell. Uh, it's not that robbery is wrong. It's that robbery should be fair. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought of it like um, a whole neighborhood being broken into, except for the, the church, and everyone's just like, "Oh, why didn't why isn't the church broken into?" You know. Yeah. <laughs> How come their glasses are not broken? Uh, but yeah, that's what it is. Uh, these are always the arguments of jealous tax base, or or people just don't know the difference between uh, what I mean, what a real business is, right? A business is this foundation on. Uh, on principles in terms of uh, voluntary trade, right? If it's not a business, it is a, it's a cartel, right? It's, it's using force, right? We have to separate these terms, otherwise we confuse like uh, ABC as being a real business. Yeah. When it's uh, ruled by thugs of criminals that will murder you if you try to compete they against their They like they're a business though. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've got the, they had this thing back in 2013 where it's like, thank you for 80 years of, of uh, business. And I'm like, what? It's not like I, I, I got, got a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Business, huh? You, you, use, you use that word a lot. I, I, I do not think it means what you think it means. I fall out the tissue, right? You know what I mean? Uh, oh, yeah, without us, you have no liquor. You have no alcohol. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what you have here. A lot of people are thinking, like, well, it's like the tax, uh, these churches that run themselves as businesses. It's like, well, you know, let, let's remove ourselves from those uh, the notions altogether. Um, you know, there's nothing voluntary about a tax agent. It, it's robbery, right? It violates your very consent. Um, if it was consensual, then, you know, yeah, you give them as much money as you want, but no more at the expense of just anyone else who does not want to fund that, right? Like, like any idea. I think the, uh, the, the little thing that piqued me was the, the Secular Policy Institute. And the secular policy is kind of a giveaway that they're not really, mm, no. That, I mean, the Secular Policy Institute is, is really more 
geared towards taking away the religious aspects and they're not really it, it's not about anything else right so they don't they don't take that consistency on, on where no this is stealing this is theft you know they're okay with that they just don't like having a a you know an exemption for religion and that's really what it's about it's it's purely about the religion and it's not it's not about actually whether or not you know, they are getting un- unfair benefits or anything. But if the DNC was getting a tax break, they wouldn't have a problem with it. Is that who now? The DNC. Democratic National Oh, Party. yeah, yeah, that's right. right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, uh, so yeah, this is interesting. They're not robbed from us, but at the same time, they are recipients of stolen goods, mm-hmm. right, in terms of these subsidies. Um, yeah, the subsidies are what, what annoyed me. Right, yeah. yeah that's a legitimate <laughs> that, complaint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that yeah. bothers me. Right. Uh, so altruistic that they you know can't thrive without that stolen property it has to be courteously for some to everyone. Um, but yeah, so that's anytime it brings that up, it's like you know they're they're shouting the echo, echoing cry of like an entitled child or someone who just feels like you didn't spank him enough. You know, you, he he hit me ten times. How come you haven't hit him enough as well, right? And uh, that's kind of what's going on here. All right. Yeah, it's very childish. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next up, China blasts U.S. over serious military provocation in Taiwan. Chinese diplomats called armed sales, bomber flights, an attack on China's sovereignty. China has lambasted the United States over what Beijing has called the U.S. military's assault on China's sovereignty in Taiwan and disputed South China Sea. The U.S. US military action comes amid overtures by Beijing to bolster unification efforts with Taiwan that Washington has pledged to support. Beijing has also sought in recent months to normalize relations with Southeast Asian nations that have weakened by conflicting claims over the strategically and economically important water space that Beijing calls the South China Sea. So... (sighs) Um, these islands are, are in a strategic shipping area, and they're thought to have untapped energy resources, what they're calling untapped energy resources, which we know is probably a euphemism for oil. Um, and apparently what's happening is the U.S. has, um, so, so this specific sale, arms steel, is totaling almost $2, $2 billion. Mm-hmm. But total arms sales, over, you know, total recent arms sales to Taiwan from the U.S., have actually totaled like uh, actually exceed twelve billion dollars, so we're really kind of putting our foot into, you know, Asian politics. And us? What was that us? Really? Yeah. Wow. The United States. <laughs> I know who thought. The United States have been that for quite a long time. There's always been this contention between China and the United States uh, territorial yeah. dispute over tai- Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Um, for the United States, it's a good thing because they're close to the Chinese border, so they ever want to cause them harm. For China, they see it as a security threat, mm-hmm. and it will over force territorial dispute claims over the island itself. But it's like this classic risk move. You know, if I'm if I attack, I have to be all committed because if they attack, you know, I could bite myself out too. Mutually assured destruction. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it's been it's been a a move that's been played out for like a long time now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think over a decade or two. They they mention unification. Uh, China actually has this this one China you know thing policy thing going, and they're trying to sort of unite some of the Asian nations. Um, uh, Taiwan being part of it, and I think probably Hong Kong. They're trying to unify as well as just you know one China because these are these are uh, areas that they've lost in the past. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think. Uh... They'll ever, I mean, th- there could be a move in which if China ever wanted to push for it, the, I could see the United States not honoring their agreement to defend Taiwan because they're already embroiled in the Middle East, for example, mm-hmm. and China can use that as a checkmate piece to mm-hmm. kind of call the bluff. It's like, look, you're involved. Would, Go ahead. Yeah, would the states really want to risk war with China over Taiwan, you know? Right. You know? So... This could be one of those moves that I guess in China's interest finally sees themselves in a position to kind of budge and continue calling their bluff and finally take it over. And I think at the same time, I, although it, I don't think China is is going to try to take Taiwan by force, uh, because I think they they realize that that's going to turn 
the entire world against them. Because um, mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be recognized as an invasion. Unless Taiwan specifically, you know, it's not not going to be something like the Crimea situation with Russia. The Ukrainians really wanted to get it. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Crimea actually voted to to rejoin Russia. Right. Mm. So, but what I found interesting actually is that this this mirrors a situation that's happening in the East China Sea with some islands over there that also have uh, strategic importance, and this is um, this is a a an area that's hotly contested by China and Japan. Those are the two main players. I, I think um, Korea might be in on it too, or uh, South Korea. <laughs> and um, America has been getting you sticking our, is sticking their face in, in that too. You of know. course, yeah. right. they're the empire. <laughs> right. So, but, but we've had this, this treaty to uh, defend, or not defend, but you know, go with Japan wherever they go. So. Right. We're we're putting our face into into this whole situation with the east eastern islands as well, and it's just my my favorite one though is with the that Russian jet being shot down um, over Turkey, right? Mm. You were and, just there recently. Yeah, recently I was in Turkey, and um, it, it's just absolutely insane. Uh, you've got uh, look at look at the people who are on the side of Russia here. I mean, there's Russia, it's like Germany. I mean, like all of these is really you know big countries. Um, and the United States, because of this NATO nonsense, is uh, siding with uh, Turkey. Well, that's just mm. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it's stupid. Don't you think it's, uh, I don't know, one of those things that are just provocation of Russia knowing that you guys are like clashing right there, just bumping shoulders. You're just mm. trying to create this excuse now to see who's going to draw the, you know, the first punch when you're already kind of prodding each well, other. Well, Russia and the United States have been at each other's throats for a while now. I yeah. mean, like even before, after the Cold War, now you've got Russia on the side of King Assad in Syria uh, and the United States attempting in vain and, and not very successfully to um, oppose both King Assad and ISIS, who are both opposed to each other. So it's like that whole enemy of my enemy thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not really a good situation for us to be in with, uh, with Russia right now at all, or Russia to be in with us. So it, it really, and I know this, this isn't the actual case, but it really seems like they're trying to start a world war. <laughs> yeah. It's like, they're just really gunning for it. They just right. want to fight. And, but, uh, I guess it just shows that, uh, going back to the Cold War, it's like, it's mutual sure destruction. There's gotta be another yeah. way to keep knocking each other down. Um, I don't like the, the image that people are pointing out, like Wikipedia calling out, you know, all this sort of stuff, what's going on. It's like a couple of years ago, he was passing out these laws in Russia. That was like, like, uh, the made it okay pretty much to, to assault and hurt her and kill, uh, gay people, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So yeah, no, Putin is just as disgusting. And yeah. they, have, <laughs> they have an even bigger propaganda machine in Russia than they, they do here. It's, right. Well, let me let me say, Putin, though, he represents something very important in the modern age today, and that is the failure of modern democracy. Mm-hmm. Putin is a very effective leader for the Russians, and he's very popular with the Russians, too. And I think that's important because Putin is not behaving democratically anymore. He knows that his presidency is assured as long as he wants it. And when his term limits run out, what he does, he steps down to prime minister, and then when that term expires, he goes back to being president. He's not thinking democratically, he's thinking monarchically, which is a much more rational way of leadership. And I think that's important to see a person like him, especially in the 21st century, 2015, being able to twist a, a democratic politician like Barack Obama, for example, just around his finger. Because his, his, the way he's behaving is a superior you know, way of, of doing things. Well, that's, that's a good point. It, it is in not only Putin, but it, basically everything that's going on in the world mm-hmm. is just rampant failures of democracy. Right. But Putin is really... In your face, face about it. Yeah. yeah. That, that, is, that is just a very ripe example. I remember and the elections that they had there, and they elected this one guy who's supposed to be the president, the new mm-hmm. one, but Putin was still there. Yeah, he's the <laughs> prime minister, yeah. So yeah, that's what he's doing. Medvedev, he's, right? Yeah. He's, he's thinking more long term, not just to a next election, not like, you know, so he's, he's acting more like a king than as a president or a prime he's minister. He's got to guide yeah. it through to mm-hmm. where he wants to go to, right? He's right. Like, All right. This is weird. I guess we can accept it, right? He has a title president. Right. Sure, okay. Uh, but behind there's still yeah. Putin. Right? Right. Everybody, Whereas, knew it, too. Um, Everybody knew he was running the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, he's a smart guy. He's a psychopath. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and now, of course, um, uh, in their d- democracies or more traditional democracies like the United States, the incentive for the political class is only to rob and plunder the population as quickly and efficiently as possible for the next 
you know, set of terms, they might not get the chance to do it again. Um, while both these these democracies and these more monarchical examples are, are both states, um, there's the question of which one is going to be more effective than the other one, and it seems to be the case that the democracy is the most inefficient uh, and most undesirable state to have. Yeah. Well, they're also the most undesirable to have. Uh, I think that's been pointed out by A.T. Monet, uh, and his uh, Discourse of Voluntary Servitude that came mm -hmm. out like in the 1600s, and he just outlined the whole thing about the monarchical uh, structure of it, and that is the illusion of authority that people kind of give them these kind of powers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing today. And instead of one king, you have multiple different kings. Now, in, under democracy, uh, it's not your brother's keepers. I am your master, and I'm your slave. Well, a multiple and, different kings would be oligarchy. You know, I mean, these aren't these aren't kings. A king would behave more rationally. You wouldn't. You, a king doesn't rack up eighteen trillion dollars of debt. I'll tell you that because he has to pay it himself. Right, right. But they find now, they don't like that the power is invested in one king, mm -hmm. but under democracy, we can have the same opportunity to rob people, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas it takes a lifetime to do that, I could do it within four years, mm -hmm. right? And I get myself all the privileges of the political class for me to be taken care of until I die, right? I could do speeches now for $150,000, like, uh, like Bill Bush, or like uh, Clinton, any president. Yeah, write a book or something. Yeah, write a book, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah get a library name after you. Uh, so there's a lot more money involved. So th is this a rotation of kings? Is well, because it's not their own money, you know. I mean, like they can right. tax us now, reap the benefits, and then not have to worry about it later on. All right. You know. Um, so it is worse. They because they get to rack up the bill even higher. It is so absolutely they get worse. Even yeah. more. Right. You know, right. political class benefits. Well, a uh, democracy is a, a publicly owned government. So public being a socialistic government necessarily, it's sort of political socialism. At least a monarchy is like a privatized government, sort of. You know. Yeah. Well, well, let's let's separate it too, right? Privatized mm. government. I mean, it's kind of consent, yeah. Well, right. I'm, 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 you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I, know, I mean, it's a guy's got to pay his own bills. Singularly owned like government. Yeah, right. Because right, right, yeah. then you'd be like uh, like the royalty of, uh, of England. Well, right? it's it's inheritable too. You know, so a king has a son. He wants to make sure his son's in a good position later on. So he. Doesn't want to ruin the nation, but just for the end of his own. But it's at your expense, though. Right? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's a lot less of an of expense course, than, of course, a democracy yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I'm saying here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they can't crash the thing, or at least if they do, they know that they'll be, you know, yeah. Marie Antoinette. I mean, these, these are your cartels. Cartels run the same way. Gangs run the same way. Look, I'm going to pass down uh, the spoils of the all the property of the we've, we've gained over violating the consent of like many, many people, and I like to pass this, uh, this shady business to my next mm -hmm. son, right? To continue uh, ruining other people's lives at your great expense, right? And monarchs do a good job at that. Instead of, you don't want to sp split that power among uh, other people in a cartel, uh, so you have a line lineage for that. Well, you've got a cultural aspect to this too, so monarchism doesn't promote the same degree of egalitarianism that democracy does, um, so you're not going to see things like modern art developing under monarchies, you'll only see that kind of cultural decay in a democracy. So there's something like that too. And the unseen, mm -hmm. the absence of both of these. I'm not um, a monarchist by the way. Let's make this clear. Yeah. <laughs> On the spectrum of, uh, of, you know, dictatorships, monarchy is better than you know. uh, For me, I don't, I don't draw any of that. Uh, you're either a slave or you're free. Right, uh, and these sort of types of comparisons are good to examine, to look at. But I think sometimes it draws away from uh, making us feel comfortable in our enslavement. Yes, you know? but on the right. eve of the Hundred Days' War, though, King John the Good of France actually had to go around to his citizens panhandling for money to um, fund the war, and he only got it if they gave it to him. That's a monarchist, and I would say that is preferable than to where they can just tax you with the IRS and and take it whether you want. Right, but that's that's okay. So that's one example. Mm -hmm. So that, that's well, the king of, of France was very weak at the time, though. I mean, yeah. the the, uh, the 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 really strong kings only developed around Louis the Sixteenth. You know, I mean, you didn't have. I was kind of, taxation was almost uh, fully consensual before, but you know, not entirely. I mean, they had a degree of uh, taxation on, on certain things, but and it, they couldn't just go straight to income like that, you know, like we can now. Well, they'll take your land when they need it. Mm -hmm. Just like they've done with, even with the church, all right? Well, it's time to reconsolidate. We need more funding. So those uh, church properties that we gave it to you and for your continued support, we're just going to take it away now. Uh, and, and that's just the church, <laughs> everyone else, whenever they feel like it. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that, that is a good uh, examination kind of critique to look at. Yeah, I think sometimes just looking at that just draws away feeling like, well, we, we could be, we'll cater slaves under this kind of rule. And, uh, just sociological analysis. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, that's an analysis of past systems and not a way that any future should ever be. Right, right. Yeah, right. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Cool, but talking about China, I think that goes to uh, 
Yes, that's right. So I'm going to talk about the extent of China's credit bubble. Since the 2008 financial crisis, the United States' central bank has been practicing a highly inflationary monetary policy. Also, though, China's economy has been growing at an alarming rate very fast. Um, however, as of the last year, the United States added roughly $2.1 trillion in banking reserves as a result of their monetary policy, whereas China has added $15.4 trillion. We're talking like eight times here of the amount the United States has. So this sort of explains their growth. So you have a very fast-moving, highly developing economy in China, but it's all being driven by inflation, by artificial credit expansion. Um, and uh, so, so why, why is uh, China and the United States doing this? Well, when these financial uh, crises happen, what they try to do is, you know, it's the Keynesian theory. They try to stimulate the economy by um, making credit cheaper, so lowering interest rates by raising the supply of money. And it doesn't really work, but it does tend to create a short-term boom. Now, we had a liquidity trap here in the United States. That's where the, the central bank is moving as fast as it can with the, with the money printing, but it's, it's just nobody's biting. Um, but that hasn't really happened in China. They've been getting a lot of success out of this, at least in the short term, but it's not sustainable. So when they have all of those bad loans be liquidated, you're going to see a huge crash coming out of China. You're going to see a big crash in the United States. And that's what it means for the United States. Look, kicking the can down the road will work for a little while, but eventually you're just adding fuel to the fire. And all of those excess loans not backed by real savings are going to have to belly up. The businesses started by them are going to fail, and you're going to have a recession as the market correction ensues. Um, it's going to be smaller in the United States than it will be in China because China just has had this huge economic growth over the past several years stimulated really exclusively by the artificial credit expansion. So it's going to be a huge bust um, in the uh, East, and uh, a slightly smaller yet still large bust here in the West. Nice. Good analysis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that stuff has been kind of proven time and again. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the housing bubble. Uh, the Great Depression. The Great Depression. Uh, and of course, sort of to draw of interest in the not so many Great Depressions that didn't occur when the government didn't involve itself in those affairs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are depressions that never make the history books. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so adding, uh, I guess, what, $2.1 uh, trillion, mm -hmm. like, so in comparison, so what, what is, I guess, why is the United States, prepare, are they trying to prepare themselves for that? Well, no, it's just, um, they. this is the amount of money that's being held in reserve, probably more now, this is as of like a year ago, um, but uh, it's the amount of money they printed to put in the banks to try and lower interest rates. Right. Um, so it's the money being kept in reserve. Has it been given to the public yet because uh, they're trying to hold off on that to keep inflation at bay? Um, inevitably, it's always going to come back into, into public hands. Um, so that's just a, it's, it's a means of stimulus. So the, the, the idea behind it, really, what they're trying to do is keep people consuming and investing. So in a healthy market where there is none of this nonsense going on, uh, one person's savings is another consumption. So you've got one party that's saving, another that's using that money in the bank that's now available to be loaned out in the banks for consumption purposes. So they're freeing up resources effectively for investors to invest. This sends a signal through the lower interest rate to cause um, investors to invest in long-term production processes. Now, those eventually pay off when people spend their savings. There's new resources available. They've always been available for those investing purposes. But when you add that money artificially to the banks, then you have the interest rate go down, does the same thing as people investing long term. You get a boom out of that, but it doesn't also um, couple itself with um, increased savings. Now, when people are saving, they're not consuming. So you've got a reduction in consumption. That's a slower economy. That's a, a recession of some sort. So when they try and, and print this extra money and they try to lower the interest rates, you have uh, consumption and you have investment, but the resources aren't being saved up because they're being consumed. Uh, so there's really nothing there for the investment to actually see itself out through with. And when you get to a point in the investment production process, uh, it's always eventually not going to be able to finish itself because the resources aren't there. That's the bust. Mm. As, uh, yeah, so much of the housing uh, yeah. in terms of uh, the overproduction of resources mm -hmm. for this housing material, there was real no market demand for that. Uh, and I guess here you can find the same way in the substitutions of, uh, I guess, the same kind of construction people uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like there's, <laughs> you are subsidizing a skill set that doesn't really exist there or subsidizing the time that people could have spent doing something else and having a Well, room. I like to think of it like imagine um, a, a hot dog is um, representative of all of the goods in the economy. You know, there's one hot dog. 
um, that represents those things. And then you have a guy that's got a dollar and the dollar represents all the money that we have in the economy. And uh, a guy goes out and he buys that hot dog with that dollar and that's, that's perfectly fine. But then the central bank comes along and prints somebody else a dollar and they try to buy a hot dog and they can't do it because they're out. Hmm. That's kind of how that whole thing goes. You know? So when this whole thing happens, do you think okay. that you know, the, the economies of China and the U.S. are extremely you know, reliant? The largest in the world, yeah. So um, when that happens in China, don't you think that's going to have a pretty big effect on us? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. I agree with that. Um, that's going to have a big effect on, on really the entire world. So uh, the United States gets dragged down as a result of that, drag us down to Europe. You know, that whole thing kind of perpetuates. So could that be a... Uh, no, this, just riffing here. Do you think that could actually cause like a uh, chain reaction? Uh, the bubble popping in uh, in China, popping the bubble in in the U.S. I don't think it's going to pop the bubble. I just think it's going to cause us to slip back into recession. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be tied into how these when these loans are liquidated, because right. um, uh, that doesn't because that that's all dependent on when um, when the credit runs out, basically. Um, but that doesn't that's that's not entirely contingent upon China's economic growth. Uh, so yes, it could call, have negative uh, economic consequences and will have for the United States. It's not going to cause um, our economy to crash, though necessarily. Like, um, so if this is so huge in China, I mean, if if China has been inflating so much more than the U.S. is, why why are so many people, uh, so many in, inflation bears of the U.S. so um, bullish on the Chinese economy? What do, what do you what do you mean? Like, you know, a lot of people are really um, a lot of the people that are saying you know the U.S. is headed for a crash mm -hmm. are are talking they're speaking as if people should be going to China and investing in in the yuan and um, mm -hmm. like you have people it, I've you know, heard people saying I'm teaching my children Mandarin because that's going to be the economy mm -hmm. of the future when the U.S. crashes. Hmm. Uh, so I think that that has a lot. So when uh, investors are, uh, are, are kind of weird in this way, so um, when the economy is good, they think it's never going to end. And when they think it, when the economy is bad, they think it's never going to get better. So they, what they are seeing is China's economy growing and growing and doing, doing really well right now. Uh, and, and that's sort of blinding them to the, you know, what I call the rotten core at the center of that growth. Okay. That makes sense. So that would mean uh, invest in Bitcoin. Uh, because well, uh, everything sure. means invest in Bitcoin. Everything means invest in Bitcoin. And when this stuff happens, I imagine the value of Bitcoin going higher. And people trying to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When China crashes, <laughs> Bitcoin is going up. Oh, you yeah. heard it here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, around. even the recent Chinese capital controls called a, caused a boom in Bitcoin. I mean, China's economy is very influential on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of markets out there now. Uh, Sam showed the growth and effect on that. Um, but yeah, I guess that, that wraps it up for China. Um, Thank you guys for watching. This is uh, thanks for being on the show. We're gonna have a lot of different guests here. That's what the news from underground is going to be about. We have a lot of uh, local talent, a lot of different experiences, voices from the community that we're going to come here to share and uh, and help spread uh, media anarchy. So with that, this is Cal Malone. Not bad, Leo. I'm Phil Paul. See you guys at Victory Party. Take good care. Yeah.